The plan to fix Colorado's roads calls for billions of dollars of taxpayer money. Calling it fees may keep you from having a say on it. And a state legislator said what? No worry, Buckwheat, I'm getting there. Throws a racial stereotype at another legislator, and absolutely no one is surprised. A repeated polluter is asking for permission to increase some types of pollution. Community members are angry, though it's not clear they can stop it. And honoring the lives lost in the Boulder King Super shooting by salvaging all that food left behind in the store. Only one place you'll see the answer to your question about whether all that food might go to some good. And it's next. So imagine that this wallet is your wallet and my hand is the state government. If I reach in and take a dollar in taxes, I have to ask you first, taxpayer bill of rights and all. Same hand reaches for the same dollar in your wallet and calls it a fee, well then you don't get a say in it anymore. Voters tried to make that financial sleight of hand harder. Yet Democrats in Colorado have a plan to reach into everybody's wallet for billions to fix our roads and they're convinced they don't have to ask your permission. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. For the first time, we are introducing something that isn't just a band-aid. Lawmakers announced a transportation bill that would add new fees at the pump, new fees for deliveries, new fees for ride shares, and higher registration fees for electric vehicles. Altogether, it's estimated to bring in $3.8 billion over 10 years from new fees that do not exist today money that does not require a vote of the people. They're basically trying to do legislative gymnastics to get around it. Michael Fields and his group Colorado Rising Action got Proposition 117 passed last year. It requires voter approval for new state enterprises that charge fees and bring in more than $100 million in the first five years. The transportation bill creates four new enterprises that will charge some of the fees and stay under that $100 million in five years threshold. A fifth enterprise will collect most of the money from the new fees, but it's an enterprise that already exists, so it's exempt from requiring a vote under Proposition 117. We need to fix transportation. We need to uh, have you know funding solutions for the future, but that should be a conversation with voters. There's no doubt that, that we'll file a lawsuit uh, if this passes in its current form especially. I think they've designed this in a way that will withstand any kind of court scrutiny. That's coming from former Republican Attorney General and current Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers. Fees are popular in Colorado because Tabor, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, requires a vote for tax increases. No vote is needed for fees that don't reach that $100 million five-year projection. I think the legislators obviously caught on to how they can get around Tabor. Megan Fisher is an attorney who used to work on public policy with the House Republicans. Beyond the Proposition 117 court challenge, she sees a potential lawsuit for the state keeping more money than it's supposed to if the new gas fee is added to that existing enterprise that kind of skirts Proposition 117. I think what you're going to get into is whether that expansion of that enterprise is going to trigger Tabor. The Colorado Supreme Court took up a case in 2018 that gave a definitive answer on the fee versus tax debate. The city of Aspen started charging a 20 cent bag fee in 2011. There was a lawsuit saying that was a tax, not a fee. The Supreme Court upheld the ruling that it was a fee because the money generated from it paid for a waste management program and the money wasn't spent on local schools, roads, libraries, or any general spending in the city. Kyle. So, Marshall, I mean, $3.8 billion is a juicy amount of money, but for some perspective, what, what's like the largest tax increase that Colorado voters have ever agreed to since Tabor, since 92? I mean, you would think pot tax or, or perhaps alcohol tax, one of the vice taxes, but it's actually referendum C, which goes back to, I think, 2005, uh, when voters said, yes, the state could keep above and beyond what was allowed that would normally go back as a Tabor refund. And it looks like in 2019 and 2020, that fiscal year, the state kept $2.6 billion that otherwise would have triggered that refund. This is why I ask you, because you know everything. Marshall, thank you. A Republican state legislator who previously downplayed his colleagues' concerns about racism at the state capitol called another legislator buckwheat today. That led to a pretty hot exchange that shut down the House for a time this morning. 
Republican Representative Richard Holtorf from Akron has a history of making offensive comments, but he still managed to surprise his colleagues with this. In many ROE rules, you're not allowed to fire until fired upon. Because that is when your safety, that is when your life is threatened. I'm getting there. Don't worry, Buckwheat. I'm getting there. I'm now, sorry. what I'd like to say, what I'd like to say, that's an endearing term, by the way. Representative Holtorf, we must maintain order in here and not refer to any individuals other than in any inappropriate manner. So please do not do that any further. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Holt, Representative Why are you yelling at me? Holtorf. Why are you yelling at me? It is not clear who exactly Representative Holtorf was referring to by the racist stereotype buckwheat. You heard him exchanging words with Democratic Rep. Tom Sullivan. Perhaps you recall we covered in this program, Holtorf once told Sullivan that he needed to get over the murder of his son in the Aurora Theater shooting. Holtorf returned following the recess to offer one of those if I offended anybody apology non-apologies. Representative Leslie Herod, member of the Black Legislative Caucus, wrote on social media, quote, This is what I have to deal with every damn day. Of all the questions raised after the King Super shooting in Boulder in March, it was one of the least important questions, yet one of the most persistent questions in our inbox. After such a, tra a terrible tragedy, might there be some good that could still be done for others in the community by donating all of the food that ended up sitting in that store that became a crime scene and a memorial to the 10 lives lost. Well, two months later, it's time to answer your question. Here's Nelson Garcia. Nothing will change. What happened here more than six weeks ago? Nothing will bring the victims back. But after six weeks, there's something King Supers wanted to do according to corporate affairs manager Jessica Trowbridge. So through this tragedy, I think we all continue to look for light in the darkness. Since the shooting, the store and its contents have been in limbo. All this product was left resting on the shelves and we needed to do something with it. And so in order to make an impact, we've decided to donate it. Pallet after pallet of things like food, cleaning supplies and vitamins. In this particular pallet, we're looking at some almonds. It's all headed to community food share. 14 semi trucks this size. And for us, this is the largest single donation that has hit our floors uh, in our 40 years. Kim De Silva runs the nonprofit that offers food directly to families and to 40 partner agencies in Boulder and Broomfield counties. And that food could have easily ended up in a landfill. Instead, Trowbridge says the donation will generate more than 10 million meals in the names of those who died and survived the shootings. Having this food do good and truly, truly honor those victims, their families and our associates. We are honoring those lives which were lost um, by accepting this food and bringing it out into the community and doing a great thing with it. A great thing that's not nothing. And our hope is that these 10 million meals really go a long way to provide hope to the community. For next, I'm Nelson Garcia. Now it's done. This donation process is going to happen slowly, two or three trucks at a time over a period of several weeks, simply because the community food share doesn't have the space to store it all at once. Speaking of food for the community, we are going to try something new with your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns as we quickly approach the one year anniversary of your incredible generosity getting started. For the next three weeks, we are going to focus on some different approaches to solving the same big problem, hunger in Colorado. The demand on food banks spiked during the pandemic right at the start, and it hasn't let up. Food Bank of the Rockies says 40 percent of the people coming to them for help with food were coming for the first time. They had not been to the food banks prior to the pandemic. Your word of thanks campaign this week will support and expand Food Bank of the Rockies' culturally responsive foods initiative. 
The program left its pilot phase just a few days ago. It aims to deliver communities in Colorado the foods that they want to eat, what they want to cook with, rather than just the same old traditional food bank staple items. You know, it seems like a simple enough thing, but it's had a profound impact. I mean, think about how food is woven into our family stories and our family traditions. Think about not being able to afford that food for your family and not seeing it in the food banks if you go there. This effort with the food bank's partner statewide listens to the requests of various communities, Latino, Vietnamese, Ethiopian, Somali, Russian, Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone, and then the program goes the extra mile and the extra dollar to find, buy, and provide those food items that mean so much to those communities. People of the food bank told me about families breaking down in tears seeing that they could receive the foods that they know and love and want to share with their families, especially things for special celebrations and holidays. So that is what we are going to make happen this week, providing food for our neighbors that feeds both the body and the soul. Text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, and I'll send you that link to donate. As always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 that come in. This is more than food. This is about families and memories and traditions. And what a cool thing to say that we all played some small part in making happen. Suncor's permit is up for renewal. The cereal polluter is asking for permission to increase some types of pollutants. Community members are opposed. Elected leaders are opposed. Environmentalists are opposed. But can anything stop Suncor from getting what it wants? Aurora police continue to clean house, ditching an officer who was on the wrong end of a drug deal. And the most Colorado thing we saw today, 18 holes, two wheels, can't lose. That's next. Aurora Police Chief Vanessa Wilson pledged to purge that department of dirty cops. And let's just say the chief has been busy. Officer Josiah Coe has resigned and appeared in court this morning after admitting to giving a woman drugs while working an off-duty assignment. Chief Wilson released a statement today saying the department won't tolerate anyone who dishonors the badge. Chief specifically noted that Coe's personnel file will mention that the chief would have fired him had he not resigned. Sunny and warm to start the day with temperatures in the 50s and 60s, an early round of thunderstorms. Well, that line of storms has moved out. And with additional rain today, we are now the wettest year in 77 years. Last week, an inch of rain. This week, almost an inch of rain. And for the year, almost four inches above average. High pressure is building in now. and We're going to be warm and dry for the next two days and a cool and quiet evening ahead. Partly cloudy, our low tonight, 38. Sunshine and 74 tomorrow. It gets better. Friday, the warm Warmest day of the week with a high of 82. Now we put a couple of thunderstorms in Saturday and get those outdoor things done that you want to do with mom on Sunday early in the day. Thunder showers are back in the forecast late in the weekend and then rain Monday and maybe heavy rain to start next week. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a straight line from the bike path to the first tee. Bob spotted an innovative golfer off his back deck on Tuesday. Guy was using a bike as his golf cart on the 13th hole at Todd Creek Golf Club. He's got a carrier for the bag for all of his clubs and everything else. It's clearly more of a workout than your traditional cart, although I, I doubt that it has a, a cup holder for cups of, cups of stuff. How do you make a change if you do that? How do you want to? How do, you, how do you say it and where can you go and do it? She's been a change maker in Colorado for years. Now, as she sees her idea become reality, she shares an amazing story of how progress is really made. Next. For years, we have talked about Suncor's stream of pollution over North Denver, along with the concerns of residents and the occasional fine that does not really dent the energy company's wallet. Where's my wallet? It was right here a second ago. So the state is again listening to upset Coloradans because Suncor's permit is up for renewal, though it appears it's unlikely much is going to change. This time around, there's a new permit proposal that would allow the plant to emit more of some of its pollutants and less of others. The Colorado Air Quality Control Commission has been holding public hearings over the last five days, hearing concerns from the community about repeated pollution violations. 
Some of them have called on regulators to deny Suncor's permit renewal, or at the very least, not allow the plant to pollute even more. Thing is, the Air Quality Control Commission doesn't have the authority to decide that. They only host the public comment sessions. It's the state's Air Pollution Control Division, different group that decides on Suncor's permit. And state health regulators say the division's limited by what it can do in state and federal law. They've got to approve the permit if it follows the law. They could make some revisions, though, like in terms of tweaking the monitoring and the reporting requirements on Suncor. Suncor paid $9 million in a settlement last year for air pollution violations. That Air Pollution Control Division, the deciding state agency, is the same one that's facing whistleblower accusations of bending the rules and even faking records to allow more pollution. State says that it followed the law. There's going to be an outside investigation of that. Colorado's four-year-olds are getting universal preschool starting in 2023. Today, the governor and his fellow Democrats at the state capitol announced their proposal for a new early childhood education department to kind of set up and run this system. The bill is named in honor of Anna Jo Haynes, a longtime advocate for children's causes. She shared a story today about the time that she rallied child care workers to go to the capitol and push for higher pay. They got themselves together, decided to take, take their children with them, went to the House of Representatives, and the sergeant at arms was overwhelmed. I don't believe he had ever seen anything quite like that. So he did something he wasn't supposed to do, and he let them in, you know, all of them. And they came in and placed their babies on the desks of the representatives. And then they gave them a chance to speak. And what do you know? They went from $4 a day to $6 a day. How about that baby for you, baby for you, baby for you, no baby for you, Representative Holtorf? Voters approved Proposition EE in November raises taxes on tobacco products in order to pay for universal pre-K. Think back. Which food was most central to your childhood or to your family's traditions today? Know that there are some Coloradans who struggle to put food on the table at all, uh, let alone the chance to provide them with their favorite treasured meals, those wrapped up in memories. That is what we are up to together this week. That's next. One in seven Coloradans deals with food insecurity. It's one in five kids. Your word of thanks microgiving campaigns are fighting hunger in Colorado all this month. We're going to focus on it for a couple weeks at a time. This week, we're also addressing the hunger in communities for foods that are really meaningful and special to them. Food Bank of the Rockies Culturally Responsive Foods Initiative works with the Latino, Ethiopian, Vietnamese, Russian, and other communities to make sure that their families can find foods at the food banks that they know and love. Amanda, who runs that program, was telling me the other day, she said, food can be really meaningful. It can have so many memories attached to it. And all of us know that that's true. Text the word thanks, 303-871-1491. I'll send you that link to donate. Feeding families in need, you know, with respect and appreciation for their traditions, their memories. This week, we're working to provide food that brings families and communities together. Brian writes in to say, nice Costanza wallet. Is this thick enough to count as a Costanza wallet? I don't think it's that bad. There, this was a great invitation to go through and see what I have in here. Um, I have one of my grandpa's old business cards from when he was painting houses in upstate New York. I just like this, so I kept this. And this is a, a post-it note from when, when my wife and I started dating uh, about 16 years ago. Perhaps it is time to clean the wallet. <laughs>